<clears throat> is a native of North Dakota where she received her BA in music education from Minot State University. She received her master's in education from Graceland University in 2006. Gail has received many awards. She was nominated three times by her peers in 2004, 2011, 2017 for the Santa Rosa Excellence in Education Award. She was awarded the Coral Educator of the Year Award by the Bay Area California Music Educators Association in 2006. In 2012, she was awarded the Music Director of the Year Award by the Nor Nat Northern California B Band and Choral Directors Association. And her latest award was in 2018 when she received the Choral Education Educator of the Year Award for the State of California. So Mrs. Bowers is in her 35th year of teaching and the last 26 years of those have been at Maria Carrillo High School where she is also chair of the Department of Encore Visual and Performing Arts at Maria Carrillo. Now on a personal note, I've been an admirer of Gail's work for many years. Ever since moving to Oakmont, I make a point of coming to the holiday parties, uh, holiday concerts that the OVA arranges for Gail to bring her choirs here. And I've been blown away by the talent and the proficiency of these teenage singers. Uh, as an a cappella choir singer myself, I understand how challenging, difficult it is to blend voices and perform in public. And you can imagine yourself as a teenager having to get up early for class, be here before 7.30, which is when her choir rehearsals start five days a week. And this is before their classes start. So, uh, and then she gets them to really feel comfortable singing in public. How do you do that? I thought that would be a very interesting story. But the most amazing thing to me about this, about what Gail does, is that every year her highest performers, the seniors, graduate. She has to start all over again with the sophomores and the juniors, and many kids don't read music when they first come to her. So we thought it would make a very interesting symposium topic to hear the story of what Gail does, how she does it so well. Now, my last comment is that we, we booked Gail to do this talk months ago. And that was long before last week's tragic events in the high schools. So it's particularly timely, I think, that we have this uplifting, positive story of what goes on in high schools in our area. So please give a warm welcome to our local legend, Gail Bowers. Well, I have to admit that when they asked me to do this, I said, people will actually come and listen to my story. <laughs> this is just who I am. So um, does this seem really loud? Okay, good, okay. So uh, I'm just gonna, I have slides just to keep me on track, but I'm gonna start today by just telling you where I grew up and um, where I come from because it's a huge part of who I am. So if you could go on to the next slide, please. So I'm from the great state of North Dakota and uh, I lived there 24 years. And even though I have lived in California much longer than I lived in, in North Dakota, I am still a North Dakota girl. You will never take the farm out of me. So uh, I grew up on a wheat farm. So uh, that's canola up on top there with a little church on the prairies. That's where I'm from. That's the lake I grew up on. It's a beautiful country. Yes, it gets cold but it's still beautiful country and they're beautiful people. Uh, I think everybody I knew 
was a musician growing up because what else do you do in snow country, right? You practice. So um, I started playing piano when I was six, sang my entire life in church. And I remember our teachers saying, when you go to church on Sunday, because everybody went to church on Sunday, when you go to church on Sunday, don't sing the melody, sing the harmonies learn how to read the music in the hymnals. And that's where all of my musical upbringing kind of started. Um, I joined band when I was in fifth grade, played the saxophone and um, excelled pretty highly all the way through high school in my music. Next slide, please. I went to Minot State University. Anybody know where Minot, North Dakota is? One person. So if do you know where Bismarck, North Dakota is? Kind of like smack dab in the middle. Mina is straight north, about 100 miles. Uh, the slogan is, why not, my not? Freezing's the reason. That's what the motto is. It has a big Air Force base. That's where I grew up. I attended Minot State, which was 50 miles from where I grew up, because I had dated a boy for five years, and we were surely going to get married. And so I needed a job that I could do as a rancher's wife in a town of 50 people. And so I, uh, I graduated from a class of 16, I should probably tell you. So I, um, I was going to be an elementary teacher, which thinking back now, I can't even imagine teaching little ones because I love my teenagers so much. But I went to college, got a music scholarship, decided, okay, I have to be a music minor at least to get the scholarship. And I loved it so much. And it took over my life that that's where I decided to be a music major. Ended up breaking up with the boy, meeting my husband, who was also a music minor at the time. So that's kind of how our life's journey started on that. Um, I changed my major to from elementary ed to music ed and was a saxophone and voice major. So if you've ever been in small towns in North Dakota, there's like a town of 50 here, a town of 50 here, they consolidate to go to the same high school. And that's where I thought I would be teaching, but I didn't. My husband was tired of snow, moved to California before we got married. And I was teaching, next slide, I was teaching in, oh, here's college life. I forgot about that. I was drum major. So I've always had a leadership role. Drum major is the person that directs the marching band, if you don't know. Um, I was the senior soloist for the Minot Symphony Orchestra. They chose one senior music major to perform. I happened to get it that year. I taught private lessons. I took private lessons. I performed in all those groups in college. So you can see that music was just who I was and who I still am today. Next slide. Oh yeah, I was also runner up to Miss North Dakota. So I've always been, I've always been on the stage. So I'm fairly comfortable. I don't like public speaking that much, but I, I'm pretty comfortable on a stage. All right, next slide. There we go. So my first teaching job was in Bow Bells, North Dakota, which is seven miles from the Canadian border, seven miles from Saskatchewan. And you know it's cold when their mascot is the Eskimo. So one January night, I'm talking to my boyfriend who's now living in California. It was 65 below zero where I was. It was 65 above zero where he was. And he said, do you want to get married? And I went, yes, please. I couldn't even fathom that it was that warm anywhere. So I moved to California after teaching in Bowbells. And uh, next slide. There's me moving to California out of the small town to the big city. I swore I would never teach high school in California. I think I had watched way too many movies. And I thought they were all going to have mohawks and do drugs. That's just what I decided that all Californians were going to be. So I subbed in some elementary schools in Marin County. And my first teaching job was in San Rafael. And one of the schools, which was in the Bahia district of San Rafael, the students spoke 27 languages. 
and I'm not sure English was one of them. And coming out of North Dakota where only English is spoken, that was my culture shock moving to California. And I thought, wow. And I remember going home thinking, how am I gonna teach these little first graders and kindergartners anything? We don't speak the same language. And I found out very quickly, music's the universal language. And I very quickly started learning little songs in Spanish because we had learned languages in college, right? We had learned how to sing in Italian. We had learned how to sing in French. We had learned all these things. And who would have thought that that would ever come in handy to teach little ones how to sing? So Novato High kept calling me saying, please, would you sub? Our teacher was fed up, left his keys in his box and left. We need a teacher to finish out the year. And I said, nope, sorry, I'm not, I can't do high school in California. I'm not gonna do it. And they kept calling week after week. And I, I said, okay, I'll, I'll do it. I'll just, I'll just come and see what it's like. I go walking in the classroom and I look at the kids and I go, they look just like North Dakota kids. Like they're just kids. So I stayed for eight years and uh, taught at Novato High. Next slide, please. So when I had taken over at Novato High, um, back a slide, please. When I took over at Novato High, the program had pretty much diminished to nothing. And uh, I had very little to work with. And um, started with just very tiny bands. And by the time I left, they hired two teachers to replace me. Because in eight years, I had built the program up so big. And I had a teacher in college one time say, be the teacher, be the music teacher, that either walks in and saves a program so you look like, oh, or build a program from nothing. And I've done both. So I saved Novato High, and then I went to Maria Creo, which was a brand new school. So I started a program. So I can now retire knowing that I did both things that my teacher told me to do. Uh, we at Novato High was a great experience. We had really talented kids. And soon after I left, they changed it to be the Marin School of the Arts. So um, I, none of that had anything to do with me except for the fact that they had a lot of kids to start the program with. But I was really proud of my time at Novato. But I was uh, highly married to my teaching at that time because I was teaching all the bands, all the choirs, I was never home. I was at different competitions and festivals every weekend. The parents were pretty demanding that that not back off. I was wanting to start a family. I was getting to that age where, okay, if I don't have a kid now, it's not going to happen. And my good friend, Andy Collinsworth, called me from this new school in Santa Rosa. And he said, are you interested in coming up here to this brand new school and teaching choral music. And I said, you mean I won't be able to teach band anymore? He goes, no, it's going to be a full-time choral position in a few years. And I thought, oh, I'm really going to miss band. I really like band. But it seemed like the time, because I couldn't afford as a teacher to buy a house in Marin. And I was so stressed out and working so hard that I knew I couldn't raise a child. So the timing just seemed right. So we moved to Sonoma County, bought a house in Roner Park, and the rest is history. Next slide. I don't know what happens in my life till I see the next slide. <laughs> there we go. So 2007 to present, I have been at this school. Now you kind of know a little history. Um, I started with two choirs, and then taught at Slater Middle School to fill my full-time position. Then the next year, I taught at Rincon Valley Middle and uh, still filled some time. And then uh, I was full-time and then got pregnant. So then I went part-time again. So I was 60% for a few years while I raised my son, just when he was really tiny. 
Um, but I've been teaching full time ever since, and I teach choral music and piano. Uh, last year, I had to teach an art class. I am not a visual artist, so that was interesting. But I'm back to teaching full time music this year. Next slide. So uh, I joke that, you know, some music teachers don't like the competitive nature of music. They totally never go to festivals. And I always joke with my students that I was never an athlete. You'd think I played basketball, right? Everybody thinks I play basketball. I am the most awkward, non-athletic person you could possibly imagine. So. I've never come home with all those trophies of being in soccer or on the sports. So I think that's why I like being competitive with my music, because I like trophies and plaques. So uh, we go to several competitions, uh, Heritage and Music in the Parks Festivals throughout California, the Folsom Jazz Festival, which if you were at the concert that we did here in December, how many of you were at that concert? There was uh, two groups that had seven girls in them, and one was all a cappella. They took second place at the Folsom Jazz Festival this year. So kudos to them, and they all got um, soloist medals, so we were really proud of them. Uh, we do California Music Ed Educator Association Choral Festivals and NorCal Honor Choirs, and then we used to do the William Barclay Scholarship Festival all the time, but that has stopped in the last few years. And if you walk into my room, which I have a picture of in a little bit, but we have 83 trophies and 110 plaques. Not that I counted, but I found it interesting, so I wanted to count them. Um, we have a little performance here for you to give me a break from talking so you don't have to hear me for a few minutes. This is my chamber singers uh, that performed uh, this concert at our winter concert, or this song at our winter concert. So it's an Eric Whitaker piece, whenever you're ready. So I have two uh, audition choirs, chamber singers, and then the jazz choirs that you saw at the concert. And most of those jazz choir kids are also in the chamber singers group.
gently by Eric Whitaker. And uh, most of that group are seniors. I think I have 29 seniors graduating this year. So that's mostly, mostly seniors in that group. And I think uh, that piece, Sing Gently as One, really meant a lot to us after distance learning for a year and a half. Um, sitting in our rooms individually. I cannot tell you that was, I was thinking on the way here this morning, I was thinking what, what has been the hardest part of my career? And uh, it's a tie, I think. When the fires came through and destroyed a lot of my students' homes, that was heart-wrenching. But sitting in their rooms on a screen and me trying to teach them music where we were not all together singing and joining our voices was devastating. It was terrible. <laughs> I'll start crying if I talk about it. Okay, next slide. That's my room. I told you I like trophies and plaques. So uh, this was actually taking during COVID when we first got back to school, see how spread the chairs are apart from each other. And we only had half of our class at a time. That's why they're so spread out. Next slide. So she mentioned all of these awards. Um, the only thing I would add to this is that I am a CMEA and ACVA clinician at conferences. So I go and speak to all these other music educators. I think it's just because I'm old. They always have the older ones talk because we're so wise. Um, and then the CMEA, CMEA adjudicator at choral festivals. So I travel to the South Bay and the East Bay and sit at choir festivals and comment on their performances and give them scores and things like that. Next slide. All right, so some of the fun things. I, I don't know about you. How many of you were in music when you were in high school? So I was talking to somebody the other day, and he was saying all of his really great memories of high school are from his music experiences or sports. But he said, I couldn't really tell you anything about my core classes. He said, I know I went to them, and I, I'm kind of the same way. I was a good student. I remember being there, but I, everything I remember was like field trips and fun things. So I try to get my students involved in as many opportunities as possible. So here's a few of the national anthem opportunities we've had. Uh, the Giant Stadium for a 9-11 fireman tribute. Uh, and that was kind of cool because we had to actually go to San Francisco and uh, compete against all these other soloists and schools that wanted to do the same thing. And you had to be somehow associated with a firefighter from San, San Francisco. And one of our dads was a firefighter. So that's who got us the audition and then we won it. So that was really a huge honor. Uh, Levi's Stadium, again, we had to go and compete from all these other schools and all these other soloists and we were chosen to do that. And that was an exciting game because it was UCLA and the Cornhuskers. And my husband's a huge Cornhusker fan because he's from Nebraska. So we got to go watch them play and sing at the Levi Stadium, which is pretty impressive when you're standing in the middle of that field, looking it up at all those people in the national anthem, very fun. We've sung at the Grand National Rodeo at the Cow Palace years ago, and then we've sung at two Warriors games, which is also really fun, really fun. Next slide. So a number of years ago, we, my mother-in-law actually used to be a music volunteer in the Tulsa Public Schools, and uh, she moved to California with her husband to uh, watch my son grow up because he was their only grandchild. And she had a set of tone chimes. And she said, do you want these? And I said, yeah. So I took these tone chimes, which are just um, less expensive handbells that little kids can play and not really damage them. So I took them and I had a tone chime club at school. 
And tone chimes are great. Has anybody ever played handbells? So handbells and tone chimes are great because they teach you how to count. Because the music looks like piano music, but you are assigned two notes out of all that music. So like you might just play E's and E's and you have to watch. So I, to make their life easier, I highlight all their music. So all their D's and E's are highlighted. Well, then we used to play them at our concerts. And one day, because I was also taught by this same professor in college that told me to always come in and save programs, he said, always, if you need money, just put it out there. Put it out in the universe. You never know. Somebody might think you're great and give you a bunch of money. So at a concert, I said, don't you love these tone chimes? I would really love if anybody has any connections to like maybe a church that wants to get rid of their handbells because they're not played anymore. I would love to have real handbells someday. Day goes by, I get an email from a parent saying, we'd like to buy those handbells for you. And I said, they're over $10,000. She goes, well, let me think about it. I'm thinking, let you think about it? Who's going to give me $10,000? I came to school the next day, and in my mailbox was a check for $12,000. We now have handbells. So did you see my last statement? We'd love another octave. So just putting it out in the universe. But we love our handbells. And I used to do three concert sets every year. Since we've come back from the pandemic, we only do two concert sets a year because the students love playing the handbells so much that we do that every Wednesday. We, we step away from singing and we just play handbells. And their counting has gotten so much better. Even the beginner students are so much better at their counting. So that's, um, I'm going to play you a little, a little thing here. We, we decided not to play them at our last concert because the concert would have been three hours long. That's just too long to sit. So we uh, recorded the handbell performance and, uh, and sent it to all their parents. It's that second one. Yes, that one, yep. So this is just in our theater, but this will give you an idea of what the handbells are like. Sorry, it's a Christmas song. You can see that they have to learn how to listen to each other, the whole teamwork of it all. These are my more advanced people so you can see they're picking up other bells so they might be in charge of more than just two bells. It is hard. It is hard. And uh, it's funny because the band director loves the handbells and his student teacher, they're both super talented people. They love it when I'm playing. They come over and watch. And sometimes I'll say, grab a set of bells, join us. And they really struggle because it uses your brain so differently than like if you were playing all the notes on the piano because you're only looking at two notes. It's kind of funky. Okay, next next page, please. 
Next slide. All right. Reasons for success, or my success anyway. I always tell them on the first day of school, you will love me or hate me. And thankfully, a majority of them love me. There's a couple that probably don't love me as much because I have lots of structure in my classes. And um, I think students need structure. I think they're starving for structure. So uh, that's, and I'm very fair to them. I treat them like they treat me. So if they treat me with respect, I give it right back to them. If they're sassy with me, they're gonna get it back. And it, they, they learn how to adjust and they're like, oh, well, she's pretty nice if I'm just nice to her. And uh, so that's kind of how I roll. I love to laugh with my students, which was also very hard on distance learning. I don't know why, but I would crack a joke online and just the sea of little sad faces would look at me and I was like, oh, this is killing me. <laughs> um, I have pretty high expectations and they know it. I, I like my high school choirs to sound like college choirs. I always try to push them to that next level. Um, in a healthy way, so their voices don't get hurt, but just so that they have a very mature sound. I pay attention to detail and I'm super organized, which I think is a great role model for students. They see that and they hopefully take it with them when they go. Um, and I'm very disapp disappointed when they make bad decisions, which they take to heart, because students make bad decisions, right? You take them to Disneyland, they do something stupid, and then they feel terrible because they feel like they've let me down. So I think that's important to teach people too, is that the choices that you make not only affect you, but the people around you. Your parents are gonna be embarrassed. You know, all these things that it's, it goes on and on and on. Next slide. Musicians versus singers. So there's this old joke that people will say, are you a musician or a singer? And to me, this is like, oh, that's so mean. But I understand because singers to me sing, which is great, but they don't read music necessarily. Musicians are people that are full on musicians and they read. And it's my job, I think, to teach students how to read. Because in 10 years from now, if they want to sit down and learn a piece of music, I'm not gonna be there for them playing it on the piano 12 times till they learn it. They need to know what the language of music is, what those dots mean. So that's my job and um, I treat them like musicians. I don't, I don't look down to them ever. I raise them up and say, okay, here's what we're gonna do to learn how to do this, empowering them. Um, we use a website, which I was going to pull up and show you how to use, but I'm not going to. It's called Sight Reading Factory, and it teaches them how to read the music. We do it in class, in harmony. So we have sopranos, altos, tenors, basses, all reading their own line in four-part harmony. I had a teacher come in to observe me the other day, and we were in the process. And so what we do is the students get in circles, all the tenors, all the basses, all the altos, sopranos, and they look at the music, either on a sheet of paper or on the overhead, and they chant it in solfege. Does everybody know what solfege is? Do, re, mi, fa, sol, la, ti, do. So they chant it in solfege, but they're not allowed to sing it. And they chant it in rhythm. And they have like three minutes that I give them to do that. Then they audiate it, meaning they think it. So I will conduct, and they're thinking it in their head, so it's perfectly quiet in my room. And this teacher's watching this whole thing. And then I say, okay, here's your starting notes. And I give it, and they sing it like they've been rehearsing it for weeks. And this other teacher at the end came up to me. She goes, so how many days have you been working on that? And I said, that was the first time that it had ever come out of their mouth. She's like, are you kidding me? <laughs> so it's very impressive. And it's something that we have to do at our festivals. When we go to CMEA in the spring, they get up and they sing three songs for a judge and we get our scores. And then we go in a different room, they hand them a piece of paper. And in five minutes, we have to sing it for them without ever having opened our mouth before. 
just by studying the music, knowing how to read the music. So it's a great skill. I find it really fun. I always tell them it's like playing a video game. You try to get a better score every time you do it. Try to encourage them. Next page, please. Yeah, I'm all about life lessons, no matter what it is. Sometimes through the music itself, maybe it's the lyrics in a song that we talk about. Maybe it is something that's happening in the classroom. Maybe um, it's something that was said. We'll have a discussion about it. And I have alumni always write back to me and say, the music was amazing, but the life lessons that you taught me have stuck with me forever. So um, just something that is part of my classroom. Next page. There's some of my alumni. So the girl up in the top left-hand corner is an opera singer down in Texas. The guy on the bottom left sang on cruise ships as the front man for the musical theater shows on cruise ships for years and years and years. Met his wife, who was a dancer from Ireland. And now they have a baby and they live in New York City. Uh, just this last year, I went to San Francisco and saw Caden have the lead in the musical theater production of The Prom. I cried through the whole thing. I was like, I can't believe one of my kids has a lead in a Broadway show right now. And then Ellie down in the bottom right, she uh, was just awarded with um, the hardest working musician in Sonoma County, the top indie singer in Sonoma County, and the top uh, songwriter performer in Sonoma County. So I'm very proud of her as well. But uh, a lot of my students go off to continue music. Even though I try to talk them out of it, I'm like, this is a really hard life. You have to be in the right place at the right time. I don't care, Mrs. Bowers, this is my love. I have to do it. I'm like, okay, send you with my blessings. And many times they do well. And many times they struggle and they come back to me and they cry. I had no idea how hard this was going to be. But that's what they try and most of them succeed. Next slide. So um, if you don't know this, Maria Creo has the largest performing arts program in the county. And um, we have a huge band program, huge orchestra program. We're the only school that does musical theater productions every year. Um, and we're in the middle of one right now, actually. If you like musical theater and you like uh, Spamalot, do you guys know that musical? Spamalot is which movie? Which movie is it from? Do you remember? The Holy Grail? Does anybody know that movie? Monty Python? Monty Python. So it's weird British humor. That's the musical we're doing right now. Uh, we also have a huge visual arts program with ceramics and 2D art and commercial art. And those are just some pictures from the different programs at our school. Next slide. So remember I was telling you how stressed out I was at Novato High? It's because I didn't have very good balance in my life. It was all work. I didn't have kids yet. My husband was starting his career. We never saw each other. Stressful. Now I'm totally balanced. So that's my husband up in the left-hand corner, also a professional musician. My son down in the bottom left-hand corner with Mario Andretti, because he now works on vintage race cars at Sears Point. So he sees all the racers all the time. My houseboat, which I slept on last night and came straight here from Lake Sonoma, our new our new love my adorable dog and my jewelry that i design the necklace i'm wearing i made yesterday to go with this outfit um so these are just that's me i'm all those things now i'm not just a teacher but i try to have a really balanced life which makes me much happier which makes me a better teacher because i'm much happier next slide All right, I am um, going to leave you 
we'll give you some time to ask some questions, but I'm gonna leave you with a performance that I did with my jazz choir. And I also wanted, before I forget, uh, next weekend is the musical, Thursday, Friday, Saturday night, in case you wanna come. And then uh, our spring choir concert is April 27, 28, I think. April 27, 28, Thursday, Friday nights. We'd love to have you. This is me performing uh, with my jazz choir a few years ago, right before the pandemic, I think. And uh, Phil Matson is a vocal jazz arranger, very famous, and he had passed away shortly before this. So this was one of Phil's songs. I hope you enjoy it. Thank you. 
so that's the jazz choir. And, and as she had said, there's turnover all the time, right? And I always tease my seniors. They're like, Mrs. Bowers, are you going to miss me? You know, no, there's more coming. I always tease them, but of course I miss them. And uh, I stay friends with a lot of them, thanks to Facebook, right? I get to watch their careers, watch their lives. I have my choir grandbabies, right? That I watch them have their babies and just... Um, and appreciate them so when they show up at my concerts 20 years later with their child saying that's my choir director you know things like that mean a lot so that's my life in a nutshell that's my career in a nutshell i have had a very blessed life and career i would not do anything different um, i'm blessed to work at maria creo i have great kids that's the great thing about teaching music because you get the best kids on campus they all want to be there. They're pretty fabulous. So I'm kind of spoiled in a lot of ways. But does anybody have any questions? Yeah, well, yeah. Thank you so much. We didn't know you were such a rock star. Woo! I actually, I surprised my students last year. We did the musical Rock of Ages, which is all 80s music, which that's my decade. And uh, at the very end, the kids were not expecting this, but the drama teacher and I came out singing a heart song, singing rock and roll. And they were like, what? <laughs> it was really fun. <laughs> Questions? Ga uh, Gail, uh, one of the classic issues is often the balance between the male and female voices. You get a lot more gals who want to do this than guys. How do you handle that? Um, so first of all, I have, I guess I didn't mention what I teach, but I have, um, we can't call them men's and women's choirs anymore. It's not politically correct. So I have a treble choir and that's all females. And then I have a bass choir of 35 guys. That's my toughest class because they're like herding cats. Um, but they're great. They're great. And they're musically have come so far. Uh, but like in chamber singers, I have more females than I have males at that level. So, and balance, it's all about balance. If your chords aren't balanced, it's not going to sound right. So I have what I call she tenors. So I can sing tenor. If I'm at church choir and we're short tenors, my choir just, choir director just looks at me and says, can you sing tenor today? So I I make sure I choose music that's not going to hurt them, but I often have girls covering the tenor line. So oh, cool. I have a question. Uh, getting discipline in every group is really important. So just to show us, what if we imagine right now that everybody sitting here are juniors in high school and this is the first time you're coming into the room. So everybody's sitting as they are now. How would you approach it? What would you do? You mean singing-wise or just introducing? Well, we're, how do you get them? I mean, the first way that you act with a group determines the rest of it. So, mm. so if you were so coming not in necessarily here, the all singing. juniors in high school now, First yeah. impression. Yeah. So First what, impression. what would you do if you walked into the room and, and you're. Well, it's it's funny because I'm known on campus as being very intimidating, which my husband finds hilarious because I'm not intimidating, but it's because of my stature. It's because I'm so tall. They think I'm intimidating. So oftentimes on the first day, I'll come in and sit down, first of all, so I'm shorter. So I don't intimidate them. And then I try to joke with them, but I do it. Oh my goodness. I, I just try to make it so that it's fun, right? I just, I want them to know because they have two weeks to change out of my class. The last thing I want them to do is be scared of me in two weeks and leave. So I always make it very welcoming. We're going to have a great time this year. I start naming off all the festivals that we're going to be going to, where we're going to be traveling. We're going to Disneyland in May. 
Do we have to hold hands? No, you don't have to hold hands. You're just going to go. We're going to have a good time. We're going to record at the Disney studio, and they're going to put our song in with the movie so that you're the soundtrack. I just give them interesting things that they're, they're going to want to stay. And my turnover is not very big, right? Because once I get a kid in as a freshman or sophomore, they don't leave. They stay. Most of them. There's a few, like my 35 men's choir, bass choir, I think about 30 of them are leaving. They kind of just came in as a bunch of buddies, got their, got what they needed to graduate, their unit, and they're leaving. But that's okay. It's okay. But the ones that love choir stay forever. I have a question. Um, how do you get your 16, 15-year-old people to be interested in chamber music when rock stars are all the thing. I am, um, not all choir teachers would have the same answer to this. I don't necessarily do a lot of, a lot of the big name uh, classical pieces because I know that if they love singing, they will continue on in college and they will get all of those in college. So I have a tendency to pick things that they will enjoy singing and their parents will enjoy listening to. Um, and I teach them how to love dissonance. Do you guys know what dissonance is? So when two notes are really close together and they cause that friction and then there's a release I love that kind of stuff. So that Eric Whitaker, that piece that you saw them singing, they learn how to love that music because almost every day as I start a rehearsal, this is since the pandemic because I had to find things to do online. I show a video to start pretty much every rehearsal and it's usually of maybe a college choir or if it's my treble choir, I'll show you know all women singing or if it's my bass choir, I'll show all men singing to give them something to, to want to reach and then different styles of music. And then we talk about it. What do you like about it? What don't you like about it? Because what I found is students only listen, just like I did, we only listen to what we listen to. They just need somebody to open the doors and say, there's a lot of different kinds of music out here. Let's listen to jazz today. Let's listen to classical. Let's listen to whatever. So it opens up their minds a little bit. And they, they never fight me. They usually say, Mrs. Bowers, you pick out great music. I'm like, I know. Because I've been doing this a long time. I am the one who is the appreciative audience. I had a brother who was very, very musical. And his whole family was musical. So I was able to really appreciate music. But, oh, there I <laughs> Um, I noticed that when you were singing up there with the group, that the young lady at the end, was she sort of helping the others? Mm -hmm. I thought that was extremely clever that I saw her conducting. She was in charge, yeah. Yeah, it, it's, it's really great that you, when you're there. So I just wanted to just, one other thing. I know my not because my nephew was there in the service. Oh. And one day I was flying in an airplane and this is the days when you could talk to people in the pilot. And he, they said to me, you're flying over the center of the North Ge American Geographical continent. center, yeah. Geographical center. And I said, oh, my nephew's here. They invited me up to the pilot's place. Oh. And I got to look down on my knot. Oh. I thought funny. you'd just love to know that. <laughs> Back when they let us in with the pilot, yes. <laughs> so my question you talked about Disneyland. That's this year coming. Mm -hmm. Would you say more about how that came about and what movie you're going to be the soundtrack of? Well, we don't know. It's it's Disney has a recording studio on site. And one of the things that you can do with your teenage kids is take them to the studio. They teach them a song. They record it. So they're teaching them what it's like to be a recording studio like a studio musician and then they put it together with a movie so it's just a process that they that you they walk you through and they i guess i haven't done it before it's my first time doing this but they teach you um 
how important it is that you know how to read music because you're only going to get like one run through and then you perform it, right, as a studio musician. So I'm really excited to see what it's like. Uh, we've never done that. I think we skipped the slide about traveling, uh, but we've been to Disneyland a zillion times and we've been uh, to Jeju, South Korea four times. So Santa Rosa's sister cities in Jeju, South Korea. And so we have gone over as entertainers with my jazz choir to perform for 100,000 people at a fire festival, they called it. Um, yep, it, it was like rock star. And they treat you like rock stars. We had our own bus with a banner on the side of it. The banner was on our hotel. I mean, you feel like a rock star when you do this trip. And I hope to do it one more time before I retire. We haven't been back since the pandemic. And our last trip that we were supposed to do in 2020, yes, 2020 um, obviously got canceled. And then we've been to New York three times. We've sung at Carnegie Hall, which was a huge honor. We've sung at the Apollo, which was really cool. We got to rub the stump, just like all the musicians do and the town hall and uh yeah we've been to san diego and then i take them this year i took them to an opera in san francisco sometimes i'll take them to musical theater in the city uh cirque de soleil so i try to do big events like that because i think like i remember when i taught at novato high we went to a giants game and played in the in a marching band at a giants game one time and this student of mine was a huge Giants fan and had never been to a game. I'm like, how can you live in Novato and never have gone to a Giants game? So I, I like to give them all these opportunities because even though they're musical, it doesn't mean their parents are. It doesn't mean their parents are ever going to take them to an opera or ever going to take them anywhere. So I, that's just a big part of those experiences. On all of your... Excuse me, on all of your travels, how do you finance that? How do we finance that? Great question. So fundraising, fundraising. So what I usually do is at the beginning of the year, I say to the families, this is what the trip is going to cost. How much can your family donate towards this? And then I get a list of, okay, I have this much money to work with. This is how much money I have to raise. But I'm also pretty fiscally conservative and I've taught at the school for 26 years. So I have a, don't tell anybody, but I have a pretty large bank account of money throughout the years so that I can help pay for those families that can't afford the trip. Um, we cannot deny a child to go on a trip because of money, obviously, right? So we have to come up with it. So when we used to, when we come here and perform, and you guys graciously fund us coming to sing. That helps pay for the trips. Uh, like the jazz choir in particular, because they're the ones that travel the most. We, we used to do 15 to 30 performances in the month of December at different holiday performances. And some people would pay us $50. Some people would pass the hat and we'd get $2,000. So that's the money the community supports us for our performances is the is the main way we get our money and then ticket prices at our concerts you know the ten dollars per ticket that helps fund it i don't sell chocolate anymore I'm getting too old for that it's that not, is so a cool. dollar a piece is not going to raise enough money yeah how many separate choirs do you have and in all how many how many students do you teach Right now, I have, um, so I have the zero period, which is the 7.30 a.m. jazz choir, which used to be 12 students. For years and years and years, I would handpick the top 12 students to be in that group. They were super competitive. And then uh, the pandemic came, and then the district said, we're not going to allow you to have that small of a class anymore. You have to have at least 20 to 25 or more. So then we had to change the parameters a little bit. And so I have 25 in that zero period class, which I have broken up into three small groups, which some of you saw when I was here in December. And um, obviously I can't be in three places at one time. So they're in different rooms. And then I just circle around checking in on them, 
helping them where they need help. Actually taught them to be better musicians, I think. Um, maybe not as high of a caliber, but still it's in the long run, it's getting more kids involved and they're learning how to read. Uh, then I have the treble choir, which has about 25 in it this year. Then I have the chamber singers, which has about 32. And then I have my bass choir, which has 35. And then I have a piano class that has 27. And that's so, what you call a balanced life? That's what I call a balanced life. And those numbers are kind of small. Since, the, since distance learning, performing arts classes kind of took a dive. And the reason being is we rely on our concerts to get kids excited about joining the class the next year. They come to watch their friends and they go, I want to be a part of that. Well, during distance learning, we didn't have any live performances. We just had recorded people in little boxes singing. So we're building our programs back up again. So those numbers will go up. I'm determined before I retire, they're going to be back up to larger numbers. Because at one point I had, uh, let's see, my biggest year, I had 60 in the men's choir. I had 90 in the women's choir. I had 45 in my chamber singers and then my group of 12 in the jazz choir. So that's how big the numbers have fluxed. So I'm working it back up before I leave, which is in four years, by the way. One more. So, so I imagine it's difficult for teenagers to want to sing in public. Do you have any special techniques for helping them deal with that um, anxiety? Well, yeah, you have a combination because you've got the divas that have sung in front of their mirror since they were this big and they love singing. And then you have the kids that look like they're going to throw up as you're going out on stage. I've got several students. And again, since the pandemic, more anxiety. The kids are more anxious about it. I don't know what the deal is, and I can't wait for it to pass. But um, we, the other day, I'll give you an example. So I have this girl that's in my women's choir that um, like literally shakes every time I come around and she has to do something by herself. And I just feel for her because she loves to sing, but she can't control her nerves. And so one day she came in to, a, we call it advocacy. It's basically like a homeroom. She came to my room and she said, Mrs. Bowers, I want to audition for the solo. And I'm looking at her like, do you know there's like 350 people at our concerts? You, you're gonna wanna sing a solo? Yeah, I think I'd really like to. I said, okay, do you wanna sing it for me? I would, and I thought, she's gonna crumble like right here in front of me. I, I don't even know why she's putting herself through this. She went to sing, I almost fell off my stool, literally. I got goosebumps right now thinking about the moment because she had this huge voice that was so controlled and she finished and she burst into tears. <laughs> but she got through it and I said, will you sing that for the class? And she goes, I think I can do it. So a day or two goes by, and I'm like, does anybody want to try the solo? And I'm thinking, is she going to raise her hand? Is she going to raise her hand? And she raised her hand, and everybody looked at her like, yay. Like, they were cheering her on, but they had no idea what they were about to experience. She stood up, and she sang the solo just like she had done it for me, and they all, their eyes got this big, and they burst into applause and clapped for her and she burst into tears again and, and I said okay this is how we start right singing in front of your peers is 10 times harder than singing in front of an audience that you don't know and we spend a lot of time talking about the fact that they came to see you they want you to succeed just like people were saying are you nervous about going to Oakmont and talking I said <laughs> No, because these people actually left their house to come see me. Why would I be nervous? They're not judging me. They want me to succeed, right? So we talk about that a lot in class. And we talk about stage presence a lot, how you hold yourself, how you make your facial expressions match what you're singing. You don't want to be singing about death and then having a big smile on your face. You don't want to 
you know, look sad when you're singing about happy things. So stage presence is the hardest thing. Important life, life lessons. Yeah. yeah. For the concert, April, I believe it's 27, 28. It's the Thursday, Friday, last Thursday, Friday of April. Maria Creo. It's earlier than we usually have our concerts, but I was tired of fighting AP test schedules because mm -hmm. most of my kids are AP kids, so. Gail, you don't have to say this, but um, do you have any comment about what's been going on in the high schools this past week? Um, the only thing I would like to comment was, um, it's been super stressful. It's been really stressful as a teacher. Um, and I'm glad I teach what I teach because after, what was it, Wednesday, after the Montgomery student, um, the choir room's kind of the safe room for my students. They feel safe in that room. And it's like their second home. So we spent a lot of time just talking, and then I let them choose which song they would like to sing, which song felt right for that day. Uh, it's hard. It's hard. It's um, I've never felt unsafe at school before. Would, so that's all I'm going to say. Yeah. Did you ever consider going over to Montgomery and having the students sing as part of music therapy? Um, well, they have a huge choral program also. And did they use singing? Do you I, know? Uh, well, I don't know because they haven't been in school since it happened on Wednesday. Well, they, there's they been a lot of people there. Yeah. And they've had art therapy. I was just wondering right. if they used music therapy. I'm not sure. I'm sure they will this next week when they return. Uh, while the whole thing was happening, I was texting their choir director to make sure she was okay. And uh, I'm sure there will be a lot of that going on in the class. I don't know about for the whole campus. I don't know. Any other questions? Thank you for coming out on a Sunday. See me.